Hello, everybody. Welcome to Insane in the Ending. It is a title that is evocative of, um, you know, wildness. And sometimes the ending is wild. And I think part of the title is to say or suggest the ending is not boring. And the ending is a much maligned feature of the game, I feel, because there's a lot of beauty in it, and a lot of times it takes a little work to see it, to see how the ending is beautiful. And um, it is particularly not beautiful when we use the words like technical decision-making. It sounds dry, it sounds kind of nasty. And to that end, today I'm going to cover some examples that I got from this book, Technical Decision Making in Chess by Gelfet. It just came out. I think it's pretty interesting. We're covering on the, on the Chess Dojo site, we're doing a book club about it. And it's given me the opportunity to um, kind of go deep into each chapter and spend more time on each chapter than I might otherwise do. The topic of my talk tonight is the idea of inertia in the ending. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. Now, a lot of people will be familiar with just the idea of inertia as a physical property. For example, if you have something on top of your car and you're driving and the car stops, there is a force on top of, uh, in whatever it is, you had on top of your car. Let's say it was imagine it's a notebook and it's going to keep going. It has a force all of its own. And there's a whole interesting, you know, history of science behind the idea of inertia. It's actually a very difficult concept to formalize in mathematical terms. Um, when we talk about inertia in chess, I think what we're mostly talking about is how uh, you can have a plan and how that plan will kind of keep rolling on in your mind. And it's very hard to stop having that plan. A lot of times our opponent has to give us some kind of rude awakening in order for us to uh, stop having that, to, to stop doing the plan. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And so... That happens in all chess positions, whether it's in the ending or not. But one thing that I want to say that's just interesting about the ending is that you get the ability for longer plans more often in the ending. And that's kind of a weird thing, like, well, why? And I think it's just that you can plan more, you can calculate more the simpler a position is. And one of the weird things about when we say simple is it actually becomes unsimple, kind of often very difficult. So for example, here's a famous position. Uh, Rubinstein was black against Cohn. This is 1909. And in this position, white played rook c1 for better, for worse. And now black has a plan, very nice plan, to just go and eat this pawn. And you can calculate it out, and it's a very long plan. And maybe I'll just cruise through it to show you this classic example where it's actually lost now for white. And you can see now if FG, the king, comes over. And the point I'm trying to make is that when you get to the ending, it's just more possible to... Um, have a plan and use it going forward. Now, a lot of times plans are glorified as well they should. It's nice to have a plan. But what's interesting about plans is they're not always the correct move. And it's difficult to readjust your thinking when maybe the plan isn't going that well. And there's another aspect why we see inertia in thinking in the ending more. And that is simply because we are more often, whether it's uh, you know weak GMs like myself or super GMs, we are more often in time pressure in the late phases of the game and also 
that combination of time pressure and being exhausted is going to make us more reliant on a plan because it feels comforting. And a lot of times you just don't have that much time to think about it. So I'm going to show a couple of examples. And my hope with this is not only for some just some interesting positions to share with you today, but also um, that as a player, you can sense just the element of inertia and see it expressed really clearly in these endings and just realize that it's something that's going on in everybody's thinking. And I'll talk a little bit about more what I mean about inertia, but also as a fan, because we're going to be looking at some games of very high-ranking players. And um, it's just an interesting thing to see this aspect of inertia play out uh, in these high-level games. Okay, so as Exhibit A, this is in the book, and this is Ivanchuk against Gelfand. I believe this is 2012. And um, White has played just now Queen to B3. Now, let's talk about the position a little bit. Um, the bishop on d2 is a little funny. And why did it get there? Because in this variation, black checked to make it go there. And the whole claim by black is that the bishop is a little funky on d2. Okay. So then we ask ourselves, well, what's the point of queen b3? And really, besides a developing move, the virtue of queen b3 is that white can say, hey, at some point, I'd like to trade this bishop on d2 for this bishop on e7. I don't have to do it right away, but it's an idea for me with queen b3. Okay. So that is already the seed that has been planted in Chucky's head, Chucky being Vasily Ivanchuk, for a lot of what happens next. And one human way to think about inertia in thinking is that we have uh, what's often called a, a sunken cost fallacy. That is, we invest in an idea. It could be, you know, a material thing. There's various ways to invest in things in our lives. We invest in something, and then we can't give up our investment, so we keep investing in it. And I think that human trait is a lot of uh, what inertia is about, that we keep investing in an idea. In an idea. Okay, so let's look at what happened. Knight bd7, rook c1, and here I'd like to claim that there are a variety, just a real big variety of moves that black can do, which will leave his structure very solid here. Uh, I'm going to mention bishop d6, I'm going to mention h6, I'm going to mention a6, rook e8, maybe even knight e4. All of those moves keep black's structure fundamentally solid um, and pretty difficult, actually, to get at. Um, so, Gelfand played a move here that I thought was truly, truly bad. And he, in this book technical decision-making, calls it a concession, but doesn't really think of it as a horrible, horrible, horrible move. So let me just say, to me, the reason it's so bad is because White's last move, rook c1, uh, really just has one idea, and that is, hey, I'd love to get something going on the c-file, right? And at the moment, if it's white's move, there's nothing really going down if you take. There's nothing much happening on the c-file. Now, one great rule of thumb that I have is every time a pawn move is made, you should reevaluate the position. But a lot of times, our sunken cost fallacy will get in the way of us changing our minds. And I think that's a big... Um, challenge for all chess players. And as fans, it's just interesting to look at. And in fact, I would say it's that everybody is a victim of the sunken fa cost fallacy or inertia, but some players have learned to pull themselves back 
from their presuppositions better than others. And I think a good um, cue for learning to pull yourself back is to say, whenever the guy makes a pawn move, that's when we should rethink the presuppositions in the position because everything changes. In particular, we can say, oh, right, now the rook on c1 truly is doing something. Okay, so Vasily played snip, snip, and knight a3, bishop b7. And here's uh, where I want to address the key point of um, the inertia in this position. To me, for sure, the right move is bishop f4. For sure. And, uh, you know, I looked at this when I'm studying these games. I'm looking at it without the computer. And to me, I just felt like, no, black isn't going to survive. And I came up with all kinds of things. of Because, you know, I was trying to imagine, like, well, what is, what is black even going to do? And, uh, you know, later, of course, I checked with the computer, and the computer surprisingly says it's bad for black, but not the end of the world, and wants it to do disgusting things like 98, you know. And in any case, I still, of course, like white's position a lot, but I'm going to admit that it's harder than I thought it was going to be when I first looked at this position. In any case, to me, it was just bishop f4 for sure is the right move, and I still believe it's the right move. But one of the things I, reason I showed this example is now Chucky plays bishop b4. And this move also has venom in it, but I think what I want to say is it's important to see that definitely part of his decision-making process came from the, let's call it the sunken cost of the ideas behind queen b3 here. And for sure, he's still a little bit better here because you know, that bishop on b7 is terrible. The knight on d7 is terrible. But at the bare minimum, now the knight on a3 is not so hot. Okay, now we could talk forever about this game, but I want to move on to the next example. Okay, so here we have a really interesting position. And, um, you know, I think... As a kid, I might have approached this and said something like, oh, it's rough, you know, it's equal or something, save about a pawns. And uh, in fact, this is very difficult for black. Um, and the a couple things maybe I should say about it, because it might not be immediately obvious how difficult it is for black. Especially if the a-pawn doesn't create any drama on the queen side what's going to happen is that white is going to be able to actually conduct an attack against the black king using squares like f6 and his pawn majority on the king's side. In addition to that, we have to note that the knight on c7 is simply poor. Okay, so this, for example, I think is a great example. <laughs> for example, is a great example. This is an example of inertia here that Gelfand now sets in motion. And what his mind is picking up on is a pattern that we learn in uh, Made in Two exercises. And I have the big uh, book there that I use as a doorstop so that my, my board doesn't fall down of the Polgar Made in Two book that I like a lot. And what he's going to dream of with this move f4 is to do some nasty mate with g5, knight f6, let's say the king goes to g7, and then squirrel around to g8 for a mate. And even if it isn't mate, we're, by, by crimping the king like that, putting it into a box, we can, we'll also have achieved something just by making the king... Uh, ineffective, right? So f4 is a very muscular move. And um, what uh, he should have played, probably, is to say to himself, we really need to stop rook d5. And the uh, move then that's very nice and actually gives a very pleasant position for white would be, I think, this move. He doesn't even say 
what movie thinks uh, White should play, but I thought about it and I, I just found this move very delicious because we stop any kind of rook d5 and we're preventing knight b5 and at our leisure we can play something like rook c6 and then do things like this muscular plan that Gelfand sets in motion with f4. So, uh, again, we're in a little bit of time pressure. People are a little fatigued. And what I want you to see is there's an, there's going to be uh, the ideas of this F4 move are going to uh, be repeated later. And it's going to be hard to pull back from them. So, King G7, King F3, nice building moves, and Rook D5. And Probably white in a little bit of time pressure missed that, that black could do this. Okay, here we go. Rook c6. Yes, it's an achievement that black gets to play a5. But black isn't out of the woods yet. And here on move 39, I'm going to guess he played the natural knight f6 very quickly. Why? Because he's been dreaming of that the whole time. And... Um, I think it would have been very hard to say to yourself, oh, wait a second, this knight d6 is in fact a far more elegant move. Um, we're threatening, by the way, rook c7 and knight e8. And on king f8, there's more brutality with rook b1. And, uh, you know really kind of a problem here because we're threatening rook b8, king e7, and knight c8 this way. Very difficult. And um, another nasty thing that can happen here is that if any time rook, well, yeah, rook a6, we just play rook b8. And if um, on knight d6, rook a6 here, we play knight e8. Very nice trick. And so there's a lot of tactics there, and so it would take a little bit of tactical imagination to play a move like knight d6. But more importantly, it would require like rethinking what your intentions of the last several moves were because you played f4 and king f3 with the intention of playing knight f6, after which... I'm sure in time pressure, it was more like a thing where you're going to say to yourself, oh, you know what? This just looks good for me. You know, this just looks correct for me in this position. Okay, and the game goes on, and we could talk about, uh, you know, the rest of that game as it, you know, it's its own interesting thing. But the thing I wanted to express was just an example of inertia. Okay, let's look at our final and... Maybe most complicated, but most beautiful example. So here, this is Gelfand as white against Hare Krishna as black from, I believe it's 2014. And um, it's a very interesting position to me in the sense that, um, you know, you ask yourself who's better and why. And white has this dream of playing rook c3, Rook a3. And um, it's pretty barbaric, you know, to be playing rook c3, a3. Um, but that is indeed his point. And, you know, the, the dream about it is maybe to create some kind of weakness. And let's just say the dynamic that's pretty obvious here is just the question of, obviously knight versus bishop, but then uh, more concretely, is the knight on e5 going to ultimately be unstable with some kind of f6? And is that bishop on e6 going to ultimately just have more squares than the knight? Bishops in general in positions like this are going to be very powerful. In fact, let's just put out some, let's imagine f6 happens and then just count the squares. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's a lot of squares. And the knight, of course, will maximally control 8 and only when he's in this little bounds 
or the control eight squares. So just in general, you know, this bishop is growing in power as the game wears on, as the, let's say the dynamic in this position. Okay, so um, black now sets his own, let's call it inertial thinking in motion with a move that I think is very impressive and that I think I wouldn't, no, it's beyond me. I'm sure that I would have played this simplistic looking thing, bishop d5, and would have been said to myself something like, I feel okay about life. Um, and that's probably true. But the bishop on d5 is also a little bit like a rock. Like, why is it really there besides looking pretty? You know, looking like a big pawn on d5. So black plays rook d5. And the first thing we got to say is it's first a tactical response to the, let's call it the trick of rook c6, namely if rook c6, rook e5. So you have to see to that to even consider the move rook d5. And then the next idea, very interesting, is on rook c3, his intention is rook b5, which... I think, uh, is all about bringing the queen to b4 and achieving the end of the white attack and potentially some kind of better fissure ending. Fissure ending, we're just talking about bishop and rook versus rook and knight. Okay. So I think that was the uh, idea, and we're going to see the inertia played out in a second. So white carries on with his barbaric plan of rook a3. And whenever you do this kind of thing, it's like rushing the net in tennis. You might get burned by a lob over your head because the rook, both rooks, honestly, the rook on that would take a lot of courage to see. But the, um, let's call it the, inspiration for finding the following idea from black would really be about saying that the rook on a3 is out of bounds. So, uh, let me first show what black played. He played a5, and this is an interesting mistake. It's not an end of the world kind of thing to play a5. But let's first observe that the point of a5 is still the dream of landing a big fat piece on b4, namely the queen, and saying to white, you know what, your attack is over, buddy. And that's been my intention when I played rook d5 to b5, to get that queen b4 thing going. And I'm just playing a5 to stop your queen a7 stuff, and I'm going to land it next move on b4, and I'm going to be happy about life. Okay. So um, the let me just show the interesting problem with this is, okay, white says, all right, rook c3, rook d8. And here, black does in fact play queen b4, and we just go away. And the interesting thing now that's transpired is that the a5 move really opened, opened black's kimono over there. He's a little bit loose. It's not the end of the world, but he's a little bit loose over there. And queen b4 is in itself a mistake because um, you don't want to help the queen come back to c2. The queen on a4 is no longer doing that much, you know, great, great work. We can consider things maybe like queen g5 or just some other move rather than queen b4. But what you can see is it's an inertia problem. And we get this in a variety of um, positions. Um, and, for example, there's a saying where we say mistakes come in pairs. And usually, in my experience, we have a sense of a position, a plan. And then we set that in motion. And it's only really when we fall on our face. And usually it's two moves. It can be more. But it's only when we fall on our face that we like go, oh, yeah, now I'm going to stop doing those mistakes and like get pulled back to reality. And sometimes we're lost and sometimes we're not. We're going to land wherever we land, right? But in the end games, I feel like it happens, uh, you can see it more clearly, you can see it over an extended period of moves like this game, 
where he really is intending this queen b4 move here when he plays rook d5 way back on move 19. And we're here on move 23. So several moves down the road when, you know, he's several other moves at his disposal. So now let me just conclude by showing this amazing variation, really beautiful variation that black has here um, to uh, punish white for his aggression over there on the queen side. Where I just have to admit, to me, it doesn't feel like white has enough pieces over there to justify this kind of aggression. But here we go. First, I'm going to do it my way. We play queen b4. And there's no queen c2 now. There's no queen c2 to, because of queen a3. So you've got to take, we've got to invite the king in, the queen in. But now the queen has trouble coming back. Okay, then you say to yourself, well, I guess I have to play b3. And that is certainly a concession because now this rook is problematic. And here is truly a beautiful variation. Check this out. f6, knight g6. This is really lovely. And now if you play bishop c4, which you definitely want to do, you got to worry about knight f4 covering this guy, covering him up. And maybe, maybe, maybe the guy is going to survive. So instead, you come up with this beauty of a move, bishop f7. And on knight, f, knight h8, which of course is the first question you got to ask, here is this lovely penetration into the white camp. And it's really a great example because these pieces are all left wondering what they're doing. And the counterattack is now coming super fast and hard. As an example, I'll show rook c1, bishop d3, king anywhere, queen d2, and it's, it's all over, surprisingly all over. Really fascinating position. Um, and I, I tried everything. You know, I tried throwing in... Um, like some kind of d5 here. I tried everything. It's just so remarkable that the white pieces go from attack to refutation so fast. But it really is an example to see something like that of um, being able to pull back from your original intentions. Okay, so let me go back and show that queen b4 would be the human way to do it. If you wanted to be super cold-blooded, you could consider now a6 because a6 is far less weakening than uh, a5. And then in this, this a6 move, you're saying, I'm not even going to give you the queen trade anymore. And that's really, you know, that's the really cold-blooded way of playing it. Uh, but of course, it, what, what are we saying? Because it would go like this, queen a6 and now queen b4. Let's just note if b a knight c6 would be the point, right? So queen b4, uh, queen a7, b3, and we transpose to this variation that we talked about before with f6. Um, however, just from a human point of view, you don't need to be that fancy simply because in this position, I think it's fair to say, at least I would say that black is better here with the potential of the fissure ending and both rooks are kind of funny anyway in this position. Okay, so that's my take on inertia and I think you can talk about inertia and the sunken cost fallacy at all uh, phases of the chess game, but it's especially clear in the ending and so I just wanted to share a couple examples that for the most part, I'm just hoping will raise the awareness of uh, the fact that it happens and that it's a very human thing that happens and it uh, affects all players. And as an ideal, both as fans and as players, I guess we can say to ourselves, as an ideal, I would like to have the ability to retreat from my presuppositions of the position and that maybe that will help me do the same in real life as well. Okay, I'll end it there, and I'll be back next week for another Insane in the Ending. Bye-bye.